Welcome to the Holistic Health Bites podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Nicholson, crime scene investigator turned functional health investigator. This podcast is here to share bite-sized episodes and unique interviews on a wide variety of health topics to empower, enlighten, and educate you to live your best, most vibrant life. Disclaimer, all information you hear on this podcast is for information only and constitutes individual opinions of the person speaking. This should not be taken as medical advice. Being a listener of this show does not initiate a practitioner-client relationship between you and the hosts or panelists on this show. Please discuss these topics with your medical professionals before making any changes to your health. Okay, let's dive in. Welcome back to the Holistic Health Bites podcast. Today, we are talking all about the top five non-food contributors to insulin resistance. Now, of course, we know nutrition and diet are the most common causes of insulin resistance. So eating a high carb diet, eating a poor quality diet, all of these things contribute directly to the development of insulin resistance. And the five non-food things we're going to talk about today are important, but they won't move the needle if you haven't dialed in the nutrition side of things first. That is the biggest driver and you cannot reverse it without addressing that piece. So the top five things that we're going to talk about today are things that you should do in addition to cleaning up your nutrition, especially if you're finding that you're getting kind of stuck and things just aren't healing the way you want them to, or you're only getting to a certain point and you just can't seem to get any further. So let's dive in. Number one is you might have a sedentary lifestyle or you're lacking appropriate physical activity. Now, the truth is we pretty much all are sedentary today. We sit for a living we drive for a living, we sit most of the day. So even if you are getting adequate physical exercise every single day, the fact is you're sitting most of the day for most of us. If you have an office job, if you have any kind of job where you're sitting or driving these kinds of things, you do still have a sedentary life. So given that that's going to be our life, we just have to be more strategic in adding regular physical activity. So of course, if you're not currently working out, that would be the first place to start. Get physical activity every single day. If you are actively getting workouts in, then we're just going to add in a little bit of extra physical activity throughout the day. Why does this matter? Muscle is a humongous glucose sink. So the more muscle you have, the more glucose you can burn, the more glucose burning capacity you have. The second factor is that when your muscles are in action, like when you're physically active or working out, you can utilize and burn glucose without insulin. So this means you can eliminate a lot of that stored sugar without the use of insulin, which keeps your insulin levels lower. So this is, of course, a great way to eliminate some of that stored sugar. So what are some practical tips that you can incorporate into your daily life in order to increase your physical activity? Well, a lot of these things are things you've probably heard about. Park far away from buildings, take the stairs, stand more often. If you have a standing desk, if you just have the ability to stand and move around a little bit every hour, you can also take a short walk after meals. You can, of course, lift heavy things. You can incorporate interval activities. You can do body weight exercises or planks, squats, lunges, these kinds of things. You can play with your kids or your pets. And of course, you can always turn on music and dance. So there's a wide variety of ways that you can increase your physical activity every day. But the key is just get your muscles working in some way, shape or form. Number two, chronic stress and cortisol might just be your problem. We're under stress every day from a variety of different sources. And so this becomes a truly chronic problem. So how chronic stress relates to insulin resistance is that we know one of insulin's most famous roles is in helping the sugar go from the blood into the cell where it can actually be converted to usable energy. Cortisol, on the other hand, is there to raise blood sugar to give you adequate energy to fight off whatever the stressor is. Whatever this oncoming predator is, you need sugar to be able to fight it off or to flee from it. The problem today is most of our stress 
isn't a physical predator. We don't need to be able to run away from it. We don't need to be able to fight it off. We just sit and stew in it. So we're getting this huge blood sugar spike that we don't actually need. But when we get this blood sugar spike, we also get the insulin spike to deal with the blood sugar. But in this battle between cortisol trying to raise the blood sugar and insulin trying to lower the blood sugar, cortisol always wins. So cortisol keeps raising the blood sugar, insulin keeps trying to bring it down. Cortisol raises it more, insulin keeps trying to bring it back down. So you're in this constant battle and you can end up with insulin resistance despite eating a really clean diet. But we also have to look at all of the sources of our stress. So most of us think about the emotional stressors when we are asked about our stress levels. So this is things like relationships, financial issues, worries about anything, maybe even past traumas that you still think about, going through grief, or just fighting traffic. These are the things that most of us think about when it comes to stress. But we also have chemical stress. And this would be things like infections or exposure to toxins or any kind of hormone imbalance. Any imbalance in the body that's chemical in nature can be a stressor. And lastly, we have physical stressors, which would be things like injuries, whether they be current injuries or past injuries that we're still dealing with. This can also be irritants, things that are rubbing your skin or that are irritating the inside of your digestive system. And this can be things like eating too fast, not eating enough, eating too much, being too sedentary, or even overtraining. So any of these things that change how our physical body is operating is also a stressor. So what do we do about it? Well, number one, we really want to figure out what are those sources of stress? What things can we take off of our plate? What exposures can we eliminate from our lives? Where can we clean up our chemical exposures? Where can we deal with underlying infections or injuries? All of these things. So first, figure out what your sources are, reduce them where possible. And then, of course, we're never going to be able to get rid of all sources of stress. So then we want to really manage the stress that's still remaining. We want to add in relaxing, restful activities. We want to strategically breathe. We want to do calming activities. But then beyond those things, we also just really want to do more things that we love. Do things that make you laugh. Do things that bring you joy, that enlight your passion. Do more things that make you happy. Number three is sleep deprivation and poor sleep quality. This is a significant problem. We sleep far less than our ancestors did in centuries before us. And there's a tremendous connection between lack of sleep or poor quality sleep and insulin resistance. And this occurs in a variety of ways. Number one, you have lower inhibitions around food when you're sleep deprived, which means you're going to eat whatever you can get your hands on. You're not going to be able to resist those temptations and the foods that you just are constantly called to. You're also going to have a bigger drive for caffeine or alcohol or other substances which just increase your body's need to detox all of those things, and they can further interfere with sleep the next night. You also have an increased level of appetite and far more cravings. Lack of sleep also decreases your immune system function, so you increase your risk of getting sick more often, which is a chemical stressor. And you also have more cortisol, and therefore poor sugar handling just because of the cortisol levels. And we do a lot of our detoxification and repair while we're sleeping. So if you're not getting adequate sleep and you're not getting into the deep levels of sleep, then you're not getting that detoxification. You're also reducing your fasting window. And when you're fasting, your insulin levels come way down, your hormones re-regulate, all of these amazing things happen while you're sleeping. So if you're not getting adequate sleep, you're missing out on all of these beneficial things that happen during sleep. So what can you do to improve your sleep? Well, we need to have good sleep hygiene. And we need to really prioritize rest. Sitting in front of the TV watching whatever TV show you like is not real rest. Your brain is still active. You're still doing a lot of things that are keeping your body from truly resting. And of course, None of those detoxification things are happening. None of the repair is happening when you're watching TV. So we really do need good rest in addition to good sleep. So 
the good sleep hygiene comes in with having a good bedtime routine, a consistent sleep schedule when you go to bed and when you wake up, even on the weekends, setting up your environment for good quality sleep. You need a cool, dark, and quiet space. You want to have good habits around going to bed and sleeping. So having a period of time when you're winding down, where you've turned off screens and you're not getting all of these stimulating things coming into you, you've maybe dimmed the lights a little bit, and you're doing some calmer breathing or calmer activities. You can stretch, you can meditate, you can listen to some calm music. There's lots of things like this that can just help wind down in order to go to sleep. Number four is environmental toxins and endocrine disruptors. Now, that's a really big fancy word that just says things that interfere with your hormones. And hormones are not just estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, the common sex hormones that we think of, but this is also insulin and thyroid and all of the other hormones in your body. So, of course, we know that toxins are toxic. They directly can interfere with insulin resistance by literally changing how your cell membranes operate. They can block cell receptors. They can interfere with cell signaling. And so you can actually end up with insulin resistance just because the cell doesn't even recognize that insulin is present. So the body will release more and more insulin, kind of screaming at the cells to respond. This contributes to insulin resistance. So we also need to look at all the sources of endocrine disruptors and toxins in our life. So what personal care products are you using? What home care products, cleaning care products, all of these kinds of things, fragrances, perfumes, air fresheners, scents in your laundry detergents and soaps and, you know, shower products, all of these things, cosmetics, plastics. Are you cooking in plastic? What are you cooking in? All of these things play a huge role. Are you getting good, clean, filtered water? Are you eating low quality food or good quality organic food? All of these things play a huge role in your body's toxin burden and how well your hormones can be regulated or how dysregulated they are just based on your toxins. So for sure, take a good look at your overall life. Look at your food sources and quality. Look at your personal care and cleaning care products. Look at any place that you're exposed to chemicals in in your work, in your car, at home, all the places that you are, where can you reduce your toxin exposures? And then, of course, when it comes to cooking, you know, cooking in glass or ceramic or, you know, good quality cookware, not cooking in plastics, not using as many plastics or toxic substances that surround your food that you do end up getting exposed to in your food. And number five is genetics and epigenetics. Now, genetics, of course, we know is our DNA. But the good news is your DNA is not a guarantee that you're ever going to have an issue. Epigenetics is all of the environmental factors that dial up or down your gene expression, which just means that your genes are either fully turned on, fully turned off, or somewhere in the middle. And epigenetics are what determine that. And that's great news because you have control over a lot of epigenetic factors. So no, you can't change your genes, but you can change the factors that influence them. So epigenetics are things like nutrients, toxins, environmental exposures in general, sleep, stress, exercise. All of these lifestyle and nutritional habits and influences have a direct influence over your gene expression. So you get to determine how many of the good things you're incorporating, how many of the bad things you're being exposed to or you're eliminating from your life. All of these things will play directly in. So for example, there is a genetic anomaly that in some people, they utilize a whole lot more of their B12 and they actually eliminate vitamin B12 more readily. So they need a much higher dose to have enough on hand. So the DNA says they're just going to be lacking in B12, but we have control over that. So you can take more B12 if you happen to have this genetic profile and have adequate B12 on hand. Another example would be some people have a genetic disposition that would make them slow to metabolize caffeine. This means they're far more likely to have caffeine longer in their body, which can interfere with sleep, 
which can cause other deficiencies and dehydration and other issues because it's just lingering in the body for longer. So of course, you could just deal with the consequences of having too much caffeine and not being very good at metabolizing it. Or you could decrease your caffeine intake and dial back that whole problem. We have control over these things. So once you know what is going on with your body, you can consciously, intentionally make changes. So of course, we really want to make sure that all of these approaches are personalized to you. If you know you have something that runs in your family, then we for sure want to focus on that. If you've actually undergone genetic testing, then we for sure want to focus on the things that we have control over. So we really want this to be a personalized approach to dial in your epigenetic responses to your personal genetics. So there you have it, the top five contributors to insulin resistance that are not food. Now, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, food is the number one driver. So don't implement these other five things until you have fixed your nutrition. This is the only way to actually turn it around. You can have all five of these other things 100% dialed in and still have insulin resistance if you're eating a poor quality diet which of course you would then be having a chemical stressor because a poor quality diet is lacking in nutrition and often loaded with toxins. So for sure, dial in the food first and then go back to these other five things and really hone in on those. Now, if you're at a point where your nutrition has been on point for several weeks or months and you're still kind of stuck, then that's for sure when you want to come back and dial these factors in. So you want to get adequate physical activity manage your stress, get good quality sleep, reduce your toxin exposure, and then work on all of the epigenetic factors that are influencing your genetics. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this if you want to share your thoughts or if you have questions or a direct experience related to today's topic, I'd love to hear about it. Hit me up on any of the social media platforms or send me an email and I would love to hear your feedback. Now be sure to come back next week. I'll be joined with a special guest, Louise Swartzwalter who's going to be sharing all about her brain system and how we can kind of rewire the brain to hit all new levels in our life. In the meantime, be well and vibrant. Thanks for being a faithful listener to the podcast. I'd love it if you left me a five-star review on this podcast so that others can more easily find this valuable information. Did you know I also work one-on-one -on -one with clients? I approach solving health challenges like I approached solving crimes by conducting a thorough investigation into your case. Sadly, hundreds of millions of people in the U.S. have insulin resistance, prediabetes, and diabetes, and the vast majority have no idea. I'm here to fix that. If you struggle with low energy, stubborn weight, hypertension, sleep disturbances, or any other undesired symptoms, let's talk. All you have to do is schedule a free call. The link will be in the show notes. And no, you do not need to live near me.